I want to start by describing a very specific milieu. I want you to imagine uh, a Western imperial power going to war against uh, another country from the global south uh, using the two pretexts of Western ideology, uh, free trade and Christianity. Um, I want you to imagine a situation where the world is entirely globalized, um, where it's not the same old nationalisms, but interchanges across, uh, halfway across different hemispheres and continents. And I want you to imagine a milieu where we're faced with uh, a strange concern with China. What is the role of China in its relationship with Western powers? Um, so you might think that I'm describing the current milieu, which is a place where the United States have ha has had wars in three different areas, Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, uh, where we're fearful of the rise of China as an economic or military threat, and where we're often thinking of ourselves as transnational, cosmopolitan subjects. But what I'm describing is actually the kind of social environment uh, of the Ibis Trilogy, which is Amitav Ghosh's uh, three sets of novels, uh, which I believe the Observer described as a masterpiece of 21st century literature. Um, the era is actually uh, the 19th century, um, the country that we're declaring war on is China in the Opium War. Uh, but you can see how the book is both a historical commentary and a very prescient and present uh, narrative of what is happening right now. Um, I think maybe I'll, I'll let Amitav say the rest, but and then I'll moderate the conversation. But uh, we're very glad to have you here. Thank you very much, Gail. Well, thank you very much, Ken. It's, uh, thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for coming. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, I think the work you guys do uh, is terrific, and it's, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really wonderful to be a part of it. Thanks. So I'm going to read to you a little bit uh, from uh, uh, the first part of my book. Uh, the protagonist of this book is actually a Parsi merchant from Bombay. His name is uh, Seth Behram Moody. And the book is mainly set uh, between uh, uh, October 1838 and July 1839. That's when most of the action happens. Uh, in October 1838, Behram Moody uh, sets off for Canton from Bombay uh, with an enormous um, cargo of opium. Uh, he knows that uh, the Chinese government is shortly going to act to stop uh, the opium trade, but he believes that, it, uh, that, it, that, that they'll fail and that the price of opium will go up and he hopes to make a killing on the market because he's done that several times before. So um, uh, he's on his uh, flagship, which is called the Anahita, uh, a very beautifully built ship built in the Bombay shipyards, which were then among the best in the world. And you may remember that uh, uh, those of you who've read Sea of Poppies, that Sea of Poppies ended uh, in a storm. Later, there would be much discussion on whether the Anahita was struck by the same storm that had hit the Ibis. Such information as was, as was available then made it impossible to come to any reliable determination on this. What was certain was that the Anahita was less than 100 miles west of Great Nicobar Island, heading for the Nicobar Channel, when she too ran into bad weather. She had, left, she had left Bombay 16 days earlier and was on her way to Canton by way of Singapore. Until then, the voyage had been uneventful, and the Anahita had sailed through the few squalls that had crossed her path with a full suit of sails aloft. A sleek and elegant three-master, she was one of the few Bombay-built vessels that regularly outran the swiftest British and American-made opium carriers even such legendary ships as Red Rover and Sea Witch. On this voyage too, she had posted very good times and seemed to be heading for another record run. But the weather in the Bay of Bengal was notoriously unpredictable in September. So when the skies began to darken, the captain, a taciturn New Zealander, wasted no time in snugging the ship down. When the winds reached gale force, he sent down a note to his own employer, Seth Bhairamji, recommending that he retire to the owner's suite and remained there for the duration. Behram was still there hours later when his purser, Vico, burst in to tell him that the cargo of opium in the ship's hold had broken loose. Kya, how is that possible, Vico? It happened, Pandram. We have to do something, jaldi. Following at Vico's heels, Behram went hurrying down, struggling to keep his, his footing on the slippery companion ladders. 
The hatch that led to the hold was carefully secured against pilferage, and the rolling of the ships made the chains and padlocks difficult to undo. When at last Behram was able to lower a lantern through the hatch, he found himself looking down upon a scene that defied comprehension. The cargo in the afterhold consisted almost entirely of opium. Under the battering of the storm, hundreds of chests had broken loose and splintered, spilling their contents. Earthenware containers of opium were crashing into the bulkheads like cannonballs. Opium in this form was of a mud-brown color. Although leathery to the touch, it dissolved easily when mixed and stirred with liquids. The Anahitas builders had not been unmindful of this, and a great deal of ingenuity had been expended in trying to make the hold watertight. But the storm was shaking the vessel so hard that the joints between the planks had begun to bleed, letting in a slick of rain and bilge water. The wetness had weakened the hemp bindings that held the cargo in place, and they had snapped. The chests had crashed into each other, spilling their contents into the sludge. Waves of this gummy, stinking liquid were now sweeping from side to side, breaking against the walls of the hold as the vessel rolled and lurched. Nothing like this had ever happened to Bahram before. He had ridden out many a storm without having a consignment of opium, run amok as it had now. He liked to think of himself as a careful man, and in the course of 30-odd years in the China trade, he had evolved his own procedures for stacking the chests in which the drug was packed. The opium in the hold was of two kinds. About two-thirds of it was malwa from Western India, a product that was sold in the shape of small round cakes, much like certain kinds of jaggery. These were shipped without any protective covering other than a wrapping of leaves and a light dusting of poppy trash. The rest of the consignment consisted of Bengal opium, which had more durable packaging, with each cake of the drug being fitted inside a hard-shelled clay container of about the shape and size of a cannonball. Every chest contained 40 of these, and each ball was nested inside a crib of poppy leaves, straw, and other remains from the harvest. The chests were made of mango wood and were certainly sturdy enough to keep their contents secure during the three or four weeks it usually took to sail from Bombay to Canton. Breakages were rare, and damage when it occurred was generally caused by seepage and damp. To prevent this, Behram generally left some space between the rows so that the air could circulate freely between the chests. Over the years, Bahram's procedures had proved their worth. Through decades of traveling between India and China, he had never, in the course of a single voyage, had to write off more than a chest to two of his cargo. Experience had given him such confidence in his methods that he had not taken the trouble to check the hold when the Anahita was hit by the storm. It was the, crash it was the crashing of the runaway chests that had alerted the ship's crew, who had then brought the problem to Vico's attention. Looking down now, Behram could see crates crashing against the bulkheads, like rafts against a reef. All around the hold, hard-shelled balls of opium were exploding upon the timbers, and gobs of the raw gum were hurtling about like shrapnel. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.